Hello everyone, this is Robin Pearson from the History of Byzantium podcast. If you're someone who likes a bit of Roman history but thinks it ends in 476 AD, then do I have good news for you. It hasn't even begun. To check out a thousand years of fascinating history and exciting stories, check out the History of Byzantium wherever you get your podcasts. For now, it's back to the Grand Dukes of the West. Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the West, episode 35, Disinherited. Not long after the English took control of Paris, Nicolas Roland, a rising star in the Burgundian administration, addressed a gathering of the Estates General. This meeting of the estates was, unsurprisingly, a partisan affair, as it only contained representatives from Burgundian France, the Burgundian lands themselves, as well as Picardy, Champagne, and the Ile de France. Roland spoke on behalf of Philip the Good and his mother, Margaret of Bavaria, and acted as a prosecutor against the Dauphin for the murder of John the Fearless. The Burgundian narrative of the events on the bridge of Montereau was presented to the estates and Roland demanded that the Dauphin and his associates face punishment. This punishment was not as severe as the one demanded by Louis of Orléans' family after his murder, but it was just as involved. It included a combination of public penance, processions, and the erecting of several chapels and monuments to the dead Duke of Burgundy. One of the more consequential parts of this bit of political theater was the formal summons of the Dauphin and his advisors to Paris to answer for the crime. Obviously, no one showed up, and this failure to appear was used to further legally justify the Dauphin's disinheritance. So let's explore what the disinherited Dauphin was up to instead of appearing before the estates. I mentioned in the last episode that Charles was keen to make sure that his version of the events of Montereau was also spread throughout France but his credibility was hurt by the fact that his story changed a few times in the days after the event. In the end, he blamed one of John the Fearless's retainers for sparking a tussle, conveniently one who died of his wounds shortly after the event, so that his story couldn't really be challenged. But the fact of the matter was that the Dauphinus faction was almost as unprepared for the death of John the Fearless as the Burgundians themselves were. While many in the Burgundian faction leapt into action upon hearing the news to prevent their party's collapse, it seemed that the Dauphinists took that collapse as a foregone conclusion. Dauphin Charles penned a letter to his cousin and brother-in-law, Philip the Good, expressing his condolences and asking him not to believe the Burgundian version of the events at Montereau. But this letter was ineffective, to say the least. As the Anglo-Burgundian alliance began to form, some negotiations between the Dauphin and the Queen occurred with the goal of reuniting the royal family at the Dauphin's court in Bourges in order to prevent the marriage of Henry V to Catherine of France and to circumvent Henry's attempts to become the heir to France. But these talks went nowhere, in part due to the enmity of the old Armagnacs towards the Queen. Meanwhile, the prince's disparate garrisons in the Ile-de-France, Picardy, and Champagne were under siege by English and Burgundian forces. John of Luxembourg, the leading commander on the Burgundian side, led the charge against these garrisons in Picardy, while the English took the lead in Champagne and the Ile-de-France. Well, on the defensive in general, these garrisons still managed to cause considerable trouble to the English and Burgundians. However, Their fight was uphill, and over the course of late 1419 and early 1420, many of these fortresses fell, and many others were abandoned in order for the Dauphinist forces to consolidate their positions. But although the Dauphinist garrisons in the north were being picked off, the Anglo-Burgundians had not penetrated much south of the Loire River. Increasingly, the Loire became an external border between enemy states, rather than an internal border between regions. Movement between the two halves of France was met with suspicion, and trade all but halted, as smuggling and stealth became the only way to move across the Loire. 
Lords with land holdings in both territories were forced to choose which side they were on and give up their lands on the other. What was once a civil war had turned into something else, as the divisions between Dauphinist France and Anglo-Burgundian France became entrenched and enforced by their respective French governments. One exception to this rule had been Languedoc, which, in the years before John the Fearless's death, had been controlled by the Count of Foix as a neutral territory, or as neutral as was possible during the Civil War. Both Burgundian and Dauphinist garrisons were sprinkled throughout the territory, while a tense truce mediated by the Count of Foix and the estates of Languedoc prevailed, at least for the time being. But after the Duke of Burgundy's assassination, this position of neutrality became increasingly untenable. The Dauphin and his advisors decided that the Burgundian outposts in the south could no longer be tolerated, as the danger of them linking up with the remaining English forces in Guienne was ever-present. So the Dauphin sent a few representatives to meet with the estates of Languedoc in order to undermine the Count of Foix's position. By promising a whole host of privileges, repealing several taxes, and agreeing to restore the relative independence that Languedoc had enjoyed in the past, the Dauphin's men were largely successful. The estates of Languedoc agreed to recognize Charles as heir and regent of France, as well as to allow the Dauphinist delegation to take over the functions which had been held by the Count of Foix. Furthermore, native forces from Languedoc agreed to aid the Dauphinist garrisons in expelling the Burgundian garrisons from the region. But this one victory only counted for so much. With the English and Burgundians becoming closer by the day, the Dauphin was in need of allies of his own. He had already established a relationship with the Scots, and so turned to them for help again. The Scots were receptive to the Dauphin's request, and so a Scottish force of around 6,000 men arrived in France towards the end of 1419, headed by the Earl of Buchan. This force represented a significant boon to the Dauphin's fortunes, and a threat to the English. But the fact of the matter was that over the next few months, the Dauphin failed to take advantage of the Scots army on numerous occasions. The English army's air of invincibility paralyzed the Dauphin, and he refused to take the fight to them. Whatever forward momentum there was in this time was the result of independent officers acting on their own initiative. The arrival of the Scots army in France came at a time when English revenues and manpower were running low, but the Dauphin still hesitated to go on the offensive with his new forces. On numerous occasions, contingents were split off and sent to reinforce other Dauphinist garrisons and armies, but the single main Scottish army remained away from the front lines. Still though, the Scots army was a major gain for the Dauphinists, and when they were used as a coherent fighting force, they would prove effective. In early 1421, they were reorganized into the Army of Scotland, which grouped the various Scottish detachments back together and gave them their own command structure. A few months later, the Army of Scotland met Henry V's brother, the Duke of Clarence, while Clarence was in the midst of a chevouche in Anjou. The Battle of Bougie, which followed, proved the capabilities of the Army of Scotland, and was a disaster for the English. Around two-thirds of Clarence's army died in the battle, along with Clarence himself. In the aftermath of the battle, the Earl of Buchan, who led the Scots at Bougie, was made the Dauphinist Constable of France, and the path into Normandy seemed open. But in the end, the Dauphin hesitated and failed to press his advantage, and the most significant consequence of the Battle of Bougie was the destruction of England's heir of invincibility. It was this setback to the English which led Jacques de Harcourt to finally openly break with the Anglo-Burgundian alliance. Harcourt had served as a loyal Burgundian officer for years, and was a personal friend of Philip the Good, but that loyalty to the Burgundian cause would not mean the return of his and his family's lands in Normandy which had been conquered by the English. He was unhappy with the Treaty of Troyes, to say the least, but he had kept his displeasure under wraps throughout the past year. Jacques de Arcourt served as the Burgundian captain for La Cretois, a fortress in Ponthieu at the mouth of the Somme River. Arcourt had been in secret talks with other Burgundian garrison commanders in Ponthieu 
the neighboring region of Vimeu, and in other parts of Picardy, who were unhappy with the Treaty of Troyes. And when he went into revolt against Philip the Good, he managed to secure a significant hinterland around the mouth of the Somme. Before long, the Somme Inlet was becoming a Dauphinist Calais in the heart of Burgundian France. The recovery of Arcor's Somme fortresses quickly became a top priority for the Burgundians. But as Pontieu erupted, much of the Burgundian army was still engaged in the Ile de France and Champagne. However, a Dauphinist Somme was a major threat to both the Burgundian Low Countries and to English Normandy. So shortly after news of Arcor's rebellion reached the Anglo-Burgundian army, Henry V and Philip the Good decided that it would be for the best for their armies to split up, with Henry continuing the fight in the Ile de France and Champagne, and Philip taking the fight to Arcor. But as Philip prepared to go back up north, Arcor was reinforced by other Dauphinus soldiers, and by the time that he reached Picardy, his own army was outnumbered. Arcor and the Dauphinists controlled a tightly packed array of castles where the garrison of one could easily be reinforced by its neighbors when needed. These garrisons could join together to mount offensives, and by doing this, the Dauphinists were able to further increase their reach into Pontieu, Vimeu, and the rest of Picardy. The Duke of Burgundy began the long process of besieging the various Dauphinist holdings in Picardy. Philip's relatively small force was routinely reinforced, and as these sieges went on, the numerical advantage flipped. The Duke of Burgundy was able to go on the advance, and began to take back some of the Dauphinist fortresses on the Somme. But his progress was slow going. Hoping to stem the tide of the Burgundian advance, another Dauphinist army began to gather at Compiègne. Philip received word of the gathering army while he was besieging the town of Saint-Riquier. He decided that he likely wouldn't be able to break Saint-Riquier before the town was reinforced, so he would be better served by attempting to block the new Dauphinist forces' entry into Pontieu. When Philip broke off the siege of Saint-Riquier, a large detachment from its garrison slipped out of the town and linked up with Jacques d'Arcourt and the garrison of La Cretois. Their plan was to outmarch the Burgundians and join the Dauphinist army from Compiègne. Arcor and his garrisons moved quickly, and they were able to meet their allies before Philip could reach them. However, the part of the Somme separating the two forces was flooded, making a crossing much more difficult. As the force from Compiègne was making plans to ford the river at another spot, they received word that Philip and the Burgundian army had crossed the Somme a few miles upriver and were heading their way. Arcor and the garrisons of Le Cretois and Saint-Riquier fell back as the force from Compiègne moved to a plain by the village of mons en vimeu in order to force a battle on more favorable terrain than a flooded river bank. Philip arrived at mons en vimeu with the vanguard of his army shortly after. In total, the Burgundian force was about 4,000 strong, while the Dauphinist army was likely around 3,000. But the main body of the Burgundian force was stretched out between Abbeville, where they had crossed the Somme, and Mons, meaning that when the battle began, Philip only had a fraction of his total fighting force. Shortly before the fighting started, the young Duke of Burgundy was knighted by John of Luxembourg, who at this point was the leading general in the Burgundian party, and the man who had done most of the work of actually leading the Burgundian armies since the death of John the Fearless. The leaders of the Dauphinus force decided that aggressive action was needed, and so began the battle by ordering a cavalry charge right at the center of the Burgundian line, hoping to break it before the rest of the Burgundian army could show up. After some fierce fighting, a significant chunk of the Burgundian vanguard broke and fled, and included in this flight was Philip's banner bearer. The disappearance of the Duke's banner caused considerable panic in the Burgundian line, and prompted even more Burgundian knights to desert the battle, under the impression that Philip was either retreating as well, or had been killed or captured. The retreating ducal banner had a similar effect on the Dauphinist army, as they now believed that they were victorious, and a significant detachment ran off in pursuit of the fleeing Burgundians. Many of those fleeing Burgundians were killed by their pursuers, but those who had remained on the field, including Philip the Good, managed to regroup and fight on. <laughs> 
As the fighting continued, the Burgundians were able to turn the tide and slowly began to push the Dauphinists back. Even though Philip was at half strength, the Dauphinist army had also atrophied as detachments left in the pursuit. Throughout the course of the fighting, more Burgundian soldiers trickled in from Abbeville, while Dauphinist soldiers were killed, captured, or fled. When the Dauphinists, who had ridden off in pursuit of the fleeing Burgundians, returned to the field, they did not find their companions mopping up, as they may have expected, but instead found the Burgundians victorious and about half of their army killed, and so decided that it was their turn to flee the field. By all accounts, most of which admittedly have been written by Burgundian chroniclers, Philip the Good fought well in the battle. Angoran de Monstrelet wrote that he fought with coolness and courage, and that he was in the thick of the battle. But while the battle enhanced Philip's reputation as a knight and broke the Dauphinist army from Compiègne, the wider strategic situation was more or less unchanged, and the heavy casualties suffered on the Burgundian side meant that Philip would have to regroup in Artois and recruit more soldiers, rather than return to saint riquier and besiege it again. Arcor and the garrisons of Le Crotois and saint riquier did not participate in the battle, and so the defeat didn't weaken the garrisons on the Somme. And, in fact, some of the Dauphinist survivors of mont saint managed to make their way to various Somme garrisons. While these men represented about a tenth of the initial reinforcing army, they still added to the total strength of the Dauphinist faction in the region. A few months after mons en Philip entered into negotiations with the captain of the garrison of saint riquier and convinced him to surrender the town in exchange for the release of several prisoners which the Burgundians had taken at Mons. John of Luxembourg continued the fight against the Dauphinists in Picardy as Philip turned his attention to other matters. But now that the duke himself was otherwise occupied, the scale of this campaign was slightly smaller than it was before. Still, though, Luxembourg managed to take a handful of Dauphinus castles in late 1421, but as the Burgundians were re-establishing themselves to the north of the Somme, the Dauphinists were strengthening their position on the south bank, in the region of Vimou. Towards the end of 1421 and the beginning of 1422, Philip's ability and motivation to wage war in France began to decline. There were many reasons for this, which ranged from temperamental to strategic to financial. To start with the latter, Philip the Good simply didn't have the same access to French funds that his father did. Throughout John the Fearless's time as Duke of Burgundy, he managed to siphon money from the French treasury to pay for his armies during the Civil War. Towards the end of John's life, this got a lot more difficult, as the years of conflict had hurt the French tax base but the Burgundian faction was still being at least partially funded by royal resources. So when Philip took over as duke, he already had less access to royal funds than his father, and with the Treaty of Troyes, Henry V gained control of the royal resources that had once gone to the Burgundians. Now, rather than demanding money from a weak court that depended on the Burgundian faction for its survival, Philip would have to ask the English king for grants from the royal treasury. This did happen on a few occasions, but, for the most part, the Burgundians were now cut off from the French treasury. This proved to be a major hit to the Burgundian finances, and meant that the financial return of keeping a Burgundian army in France was now significantly reduced. Philip the Bold had built the foundations of the Burgundian state on French royal revenues, and John the Fearless had managed to punt most of the cost of the Civil War to the French treasury. But Philip the Good could not do either. Involvement in France had gone from profit to break-even to loss. Wim Blockmans and Walter Prevenir wrote, quote, French royal funds had constituted 65% of the ducal income of John the Fearless. All of these flows suddenly ended after the murder at Montereau leaving Duke Philip with the relatively modest income of his own domains and aids from Flanders, Artois, and Burgundy. His options in France being severely reduced, he had to turn to other horizons to seek means to keep up the high ambitions of his predecessors. That horizon would be found in the Low Countries. This brings us to the fact that Philip was coming to the conclusion that the future of the Burgundian project was not in France, 
but in the Low Countries. Philip began his expansion in mid-1421 when he purchased the right to inherit the county of Namor from its childless and indebted duke. This was an expensive undertaking, coming at a time when Philip's finances were stretched, but it does show that territorial aggrandizement in the Low Countries was a priority for Philip since the beginning of his reign. So while Philip spent almost all of 1420 in France, much of the rest of his reign was spent in his own territories or in other Low Country principalities. Since splitting off from the English to deal with Jacques de Arcourt, Philip's participation in the Hundred Years' War mostly came down to the defense of his own territories, with the occasional action against Dauphinist France sprinkled in here and there. Henry V carried on the fight in the Ile-de-France and Champagne, and often asked his ally for reinforcements from the Burgundian territories. But, for the most part, Philip either had no men to spare, or simply did not consider it worth it to send help. Most of the Burgundian levies from Artois and Picardy were focused on the Somme, while knights from the two Burgundies were also occupied close to home. Well, for the most part, the two Burgundies themselves were insulated from attack. Raids into the county of Nevers in the west and the Balawick of Macon in the south were common. Much of the southwest flank of Burgundy was taken up with lands owned by the Duke of Bourbon. While John of Bourbon was a fierce Armagnac earlier in his life, he had been captured at Agincourt and remained a prisoner in England ever since. So, John was eager to reach a deal with the English which could ensure his freedom, and having the Duke of Burgundy on side meant that one more person could lobby the English on his behalf. A limited treaty of non-aggression between Bourbon and Burgundy had existed since 1412. This deal prevented raids into each other's territories and established that any military campaign would have to be preceded by three weeks of warning. In the years after John the Fearless's murder, Margaret of Bavaria, who now ruled the two Burgundies on behalf of her son rather than her husband, had overseen the expansion of this deal into a marriage alliance between the houses. Philip's sister Agnes was betrothed to Charles, the Count of Clermont and heir to the Bourbon lands, in 1422, and this match sealed both the ongoing Treaty of Neutrality as well as other deals dedicated to facilitating regional trade. Many of the two Burgundy's other frontiers were assured by similar deals. The duchies of Bar and Lorraine, which bordered the county of Burgundy in the north, had both been Burgundian allies under John the Fearless, but were beginning to show signs that they might stray from the Burgundian orbit. This was best demonstrated by the closeness of Louis of Bar to his grand nephew, René of Anjou, and his ambitions for the young prince. Louis of Bar and René's mother, Yolanda of Aragon, managed to arrange for René to marry the daughter of the Duke of Lorraine in 1419. This meant that there was a good chance that both Bar and Lorraine would fall into the hands of the House of Anjou, a dangerous prospect for the Burgundians. Nevertheless, in the early years of Philip's reign, he was able to re-establish the Burgundian leanings of those duchies, with the Duke of Lorraine even signing on to the Treaty of Troyes and agreeing to aid the Anglo-Burgundian war effort. To the south of the county of Burgundy was the Duchy of Savoy. The Duke of Savoy, Amadeus VIII, was Philip the Good's uncle and had been a Burgundian ally since the reign of Philip the Bold. Unlike the Duke of Lorraine, Amadeus refused to aid the Burgundian faction militarily, but he did lend a diplomatic hand to his nephew. On several occasions, Amadeus helped to negotiate and moderate talks between the Burgundians and the Dauphinists. These deals, facilitated by the Duke of Savoy, ranged from simple prisoner exchanges to attempts at a general reconciliation between the French parties. Moreover, the Duchy of Burgundy was bordered by Champagne to the north, which, while not entirely Burgundian at this point, was mostly Burgundian especially the parts of the region closest to the duchy. And in the west, Burgundy was insulated by Nevers. Still though, Nevers itself was exposed to some of the most stridently Dauphinous parts of France, such as the Duchy of Berry to its west. But let's put a pin in that for now, because while a major Dauphinist offensive into Nevers is coming in the spring of 1422 
the Somme Valley was still at the forefront of the minds of the Burgundian leadership. So at the beginning of the campaign season, John of Luxembourg gathered an Anglo-Burgundian army, about 3,000 strong, and set off into Picardy. Their first target was the castle of Quenoy, not to be confused with Le Quenoy in Hainaut. Quenoy guarded the road from Wa to Amiens, and it was chosen as a starting point due to its relative isolation, as it could not be reinforced with the same ease as many of the other garrisons could. So John of Luxembourg was able to settle into a siege without worrying about the approach of another Dauphinist force. The Burgundian artillery, which John took with him, made short work of the walls of Quenoy. The castle was taken and razed to the ground, and most of the garrison was hung. The example made at Quenoy encouraged a number of other Dauphinist strongholds to surrender when John approached. However, further west, the Dauphinists were still strong, and that was where John of Luxembourg's army was heading next. The garrisons around the mouth of the Somme were stronger and closer together, which meant that reinforcement was far easier. And while Luxembourg was campaigning in Vimou, more Dauphinist soldiers were able to enter the Somme Valley through Le Cretois and began to work on reversing John's progress. As he besieged one fortress, Dauphinists took back another, and as he marched through Vimou, his forces were harassed and occasionally attacked outright. A few times, minor pitched battles took place, where the Burgundians were usually victorious, but these did little to weaken the garrisons. Even John's successful sieges were not as decisive as Quenoy, so conditional surrenders carried the day rather than unconditional. When John did take a new fortress in Vimou, its garrison was usually allowed to leave and join another Dauphina stronghold, so the enemy forces in the region were maintained even after a Burgundian victory. Jonathan Sumption describes the Dauphinist presence in Picardy as a network of fortresses linked by mutual support rather than a mere collection of castles. The Anglo-Burgundian armies, which occasionally campaigned in the region, could really only focus on one or two at a time, so the rest of the garrisons could sally out to harass the armies and force these sieges to be lifted. The network in the Somme Valley was further linked to other major Dauphinus strongholds in the north, such as Compiègne, Meaux, and Guise. We already saw that an army from Compiègne attempted to reinforce the Somme Valley until it was stopped at mons en vimeu and aid coming from the other Dauphinus sites steadily made its way towards the Somme. Towards the end of spring 1422, John of Luxembourg concluded that his campaign was costing the Burgundians much and producing little, so he decided to pack it in and redirect his attentions elsewhere. But the Dauphinist network in the north was about to be dealt a major blow. Henry V had been besieging Meaux since autumn of 1421, and in May 1422 the town surrendered. Meaux was one of the largest and strongest Dauphinist garrisons in the north of France, and controlled important roadways between Paris and Picardy. Its fall not only freed up the main English army, but also secured much of the Seine and Yonne valleys, and cut off Dauphinist Picardy for much of the rest of France. Now, Le Cretois was their only inlet and outlet. Shortly after Meaux fell, Compiègne surrendered, as did many other hostile fortresses in Picardy and Champagne. The steady expansion of Arcor's network of fortresses was ended and reversed in the days after the fall of Meaux. He still controlled the kernel of his once mighty network around the mouth of the Somme and in Vimeu, but now he was isolated. With the English no longer occupied at Meaux, their advance began again. The Earl of Warwick, one of Henry's leading generals, began to gather a fleet to try and cut off the Picard Dauphinists from the sea as he led another army towards the Somme. This campaign would be a mostly English affair, as the Burgundians now refocused their energies on Champagne. On his way to Le Cretois, Warwick managed to clear out many of the garrisons of Vimeu, which had caused Luxembourg so much trouble a few months back. And in late June, he began a siege of saint valery a town right across the Somme from Le Cretois. saint valery fell after a few days of bombardment, and Le Cretois was next on the chopping block. Jonathan Sumption writes, quote, 
Apart from Guise and the upper valley of the Oise, and the small river port of Noyel at the head of the Somme estuary, this was all that now remained of the great chain of Dauphinist fortresses that had extended across France, from the Channel to Champagne, only six months before. But Le Cretois would hold out for a while longer, and events elsewhere in France would force Warwick to lift his siege. But now that it was no longer the heart of a vast network of Dauphinist fortresses, and was cut off from the sea by an English fleet, it ceased to be a major danger. So now let's return to Nevers, which was now under threat from our old friend, Tanguy du Châtel. Châtel had gathered a large army in Orléans, and around the time that the English were mopping up in Vimou, the Breton knight launched an invasion of Nevers. The local Burgundian forces were no match for Châtel's army, and much of the Burgundian county was occupied in a matter of weeks. One of the most significant conquests by the Dauphinists was the town of La Charite, which guarded an important crossing of the Loire River in Nevers. With the town in Dauphinist hands, the two Burgundies were suddenly much more exposed. At this point, the only Burgundian stronghold left in the region was the town of Caen. While this campaign into Nevers was ongoing, Philip the Good was in Champagne, mustering his troops with the intention of campaigning there and in Picardy. But the threat to his southern lands changed his calculus. Philip sent word to John of Luxembourg to gather more soldiers from the north, and he was joined by other important Burgundian Low Country officials, such as Hugh de Lannoy and Antoine of Croy. Remember those names. And, towards the end of June, the Burgundian forces met up in the Duchy of Burgundy, and began marching into Nevers. They were joined by an English force led by the Duke of Bedford, Henry V's oldest surviving brother, and another name to remember, as well as the Earl of Warwick, who had raised his siege of Le Cretois to join the campaign in Nevers. The English king had intended to lead this force himself, but was prevented from doing so by a serious illness. The reason that the English army was so eager to campaign in Nevers was not only because of their need to keep the Burgundian alliance alive, but also because the Dauphinist army in the county represented a significant portion of the faction's manpower, and a decisive battle could significantly weaken Charles's position in France. When everyone met up, the Duke of Burgundy had with him about 9,000 soldiers, and the English had 3,000 making the joint Anglo-Burgundian field army one of the largest of the past few years. The Dauphinist army in Nevers was closer to 6,000 men in size, and so, while they may have been prepared to fight a battle at one point, they had no intention of being outnumbered two to one. The Dauphinists were currently besieging Caen, but as word of the coming Anglo-Burgundian army reached them, they decided to withdraw and retreat back across the Loire. The Anglo-Burgundian force swept through Nevers and re-secured much of the county with relative ease, but La Charite remained in Dauphinist hands. Furthermore, despite their best efforts, such as calling the Dauphinists chickens and whatnot, Philip the Good, John of Luxembourg, and the Duke of Bedford were unable to draw the Dauphinist army into a battle. While the campaign in Nevers was largely successful for the Burgundians, the soldiers which had been taken from English Normandy for the campaign led to the weakening of the duchy's defenses, and another Dauphinist army was able to launch an offensive there. Meanwhile, back in Paris, Henry V's illness had only gotten worse, and in the end of August 1422, the King of England and heir to France died. His son, Henry VI, was only nine months old, which meant that arrangements for a regency would have to be made. On his deathbed, Henry V offered the Regency of France to Philip the Good, but, in a move that his father and grandfather would have balked at, the Duke of Burgundy refused. Therefore, the Duke of Bedford was named the English Regent in France, and his other brother, the Duke of Gloucester, was named the Regent in England. Henry's final instructions to Bedford were to carry on the conquest of France, but to be open to a peace deal with the Dauphin and to keep the Burgundian alliance alive. For the love of God, keep the Burgundian alliance alive. It was a shock to everyone that the young and vigorous Henry V was outlived by his father-in-law. The Treaty of Troyes established that Henry V and his heirs 
would succeed to France after the death of King Charles, but Henry himself was a vital part of the English presence in the kingdom. Lancastrian France was now no longer led by a warrior king, but instead by an infant and a regency. Less than two months after the death of Henry V, King Charles VI of France died. The Dauphin claimed to be Charles VII, while the English supported the claim of the now 11-month-old Henry VI of England to be Henry II of France as well. The funeral of Charles VI was an outlier among the funerals of the kings of France. No great French lords took part, as many were either imprisoned in England after Agincourt or unwelcome in Anglo-Burgundian Paris. Philip the Good was reportedly offended by not being granted the most prestigious role in the ceremony and refused to participate. Queen Isabeau was under an unofficial house arrest, the king's daughters were in England and Brittany, and his son was fighting south of the Loire. The role of officiant was thus left to the Duke of Bedford. Charles VI became king way back in episode 9, and it honestly feels a little weird to leave his reign. Sure, he hasn't done much effective ruling since episode 15, but his mental troubles and the corresponding political turmoil defined the events of the past three decades. Charles VII will be a much different king than his father, while Henry VI will share some notable similarities with him. The deaths of the kings of England and France so close to each other created an uncertain political situation, which left the fate of France up in the air. But the war goes on. The dual monarchy of England and France, now led by the Duke of Bedford, will continue its advance while Charles VII's Kingdom of Bourges continues its resistance. All the while, Philip the Good is beginning to pull back from affairs in France and is looking to the Low Countries more and more. Thank you so much to my patrons. Christine, Duchesse de Namur. Peter, Duc de Brancion. Elliot, Graf von Kravenstein. Anthony, Comte de chateauneuf nuxois James, Graf von Temsa. Preston, Comte de saint fargo Mark, Comte de Merceau. Diana, Graf von Biersel. Mehmet, Comte Santer, Chris, Comte de Simour, David, Graf von Bornem, Rosa, Comte de Germont, Elliot, Comte de bussy le grand Quinton, Graf von Blasfeld, Tyler, Comte de Chamaray, Ian, Graf von Arenberg, and to my Knights of the Duchy. If you want to join them, you can at patreon.com slash Burgundy. If you want to support the podcast in other ways, you can do so by leaving a review on your podcast app of choice and telling your friends about the show. Both really help to grow the show and will earn you my everlasting appreciation. If you want to keep up with the show, you can follow me at Valois Burgundy on Twitter or Blue Sky or find Grand Dukes of the West on Facebook. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest at gmail.com and check out the podcast website for maps, images, sources, and more at granddukesofthewest.com. Once again, thank you for listening.